Okay, welcome back. Uh, we're going to wrap up Chapter 7 of the Wrath is Text for Introductory Psychology. Uh, chapter 7, of course, is on a broad range of topics that fall under the umbrella of cognitive psychology. And so our last topic, uh, we'll be looking at the subject of intelligence, um, a subject that is, um, even to this day, a subject of great debate uh, in the field of psychology, uh, especially if we're considering the question of whether is, is intelligence a singular ability or is intelligence a collection of abilities or, or, or can, is it can be expressed in a multitude of, of ways or a multitude of abilities. So a debate that still rages on. So how do we define intelligence? Well, a lot of definitions go strictly back to problem solving. The Rathis text, of course, talks about the ability to understand the world and cope with challenges. And really, to me, that's a fancy way of saying uh, especially the cope with challenging challenges part is you know problem solving because problem solve problems are just another word for challenges that we have to deal with again whether they're literal math problems or problems of deciding what to eat each day or larger problems of deciding what to do with your life career and school wise I mean you know we're we're always sort of encountering problems and challenges and and how we understand the world oftentimes determines how we deal with those challenges so there's a lot of sort of overlap there. A lot of how we think about intelligence in this in, in the Western world is linked to achievement, especially with things like academic achievement and occupational status. We associate people in certain positions with high intelligence, you know, doctors, lawyers, professors, um, you know, anybody who has to go through a lot of schooling, for example, we, we associate um, oftentimes with intelligence, and that's not to say they aren't related. There is a strong correlation between intelligence and, and academic performance, but it's not always the case. There are a lot of other factors that go into it as well. You know, there's a lot of motivation, a lot of non-cognitive, non-intelligence factors that play into that as well, so it should be uh, noted. So, um, some different theories about intelligence. The first one we're going to look at um, is... Charles Spearman's theory of intelligence. Uh, well, excuse me. Yeah, the first one is Charles uh, Charles Spearman, um, and he is the first theorist we're going to talk about who who looked at intelligence as a singular ability, um, the singular factor, if you will. And what he called it, he just simply called it the letter G. Charles Spearman uh, called intelligence G, or representing our our general intelligence, which our general intelligence, of course, is used to uh, develop skills under specific abilities. So, but every sort of ability is underlied by this general intelligence, according to Spearman. And to be honest, in the current field of psychology, especially in education and, and other areas that look at intelligence, this is the predominant theory. Charles Spearman's um, G theory on intelligence is the one that most people subscribe to. But of course, there are other theories out there, which we'll look at in just a moment. You know, Thurston, for example, uh, looked at looked at sort of these specific abilities, looked at them as eight specific factors or primary mental abilities. Uh, those abilities are visual and spatial, um, perceptual speed, basically how fast you process stuff, numerical ability, are you good with mathematics, verbal meaning, understanding the meaning of words, uh, how good is your memory, you know, and especially when we talk about working memory, we talked about in a previous chapter, that's one area that is uh, measured a lot in intelligence is working memory, how much you can hold on to it and how fast you can process stuff. Uh, word fluency, how quickly you can think of words, you know, if you're performing crossword puzzles or Sudokus or rhyming, things like that. I know Sudokus are not uh, words, but puzzles like that, that kind of, you have to think quickly. Uh, deductive reasoning, inductive reasoning. These are the, these are the mental abilities according to Thurston, um, but they're, according to tying it back to Spearman, they're all underlying, they're all sort of uh, tied back to this general intelligence known as G. Now, other theorists like Howard Gardner, for example, argue that there, what about multiple intelligences? There's a number of different ways to be intelligent. Um, however, some people have criticized theorists like this. The response is, well, do the talents that, you know, these other ways that you're talking about being intelligent, do they represent intelligence or maybe just special talents that are again tied back to this singular intelligence called G. Howard Gardner, I think the last time I checked, he proposed there's 13, 12 to 13 different ways that people can be intelligent, but I think only like eight, nine, or 10 of them have been verified. So not even all of them have been verified. Like kinesthetic intelligence, like with your body being an athlete, um, intrapersonal, interpersonal, mathematics, 
uh, naturalism, you know, being a scientist, things like that. So a number of different ways that people can express their intelligence. So again, are these actually intelligences? Are they in a different way of expressing this general intelligence? That's still a debate that goes on to this day. Robert Sternberg believed that we have what's known as the triarchic theory of intelligence. There's three different types of intelligence. There's analytical, creative, and practical. And a way I like to think of this is analytical is book smarts. You're really good at, you know, you know, thriving in academic settings or settings where you have to use, you know, maybe your mind and in, in, in sort of in a much more logical uh, structured way. So we would call this book smarts. And then creative is kind of what it sounds. You're able to solve novel problems. You're able to come up with new solutions, things like that. You're creative. In practical, this is street smarts. You know, this is being able to, to work within your environment, work with people, kind of navigate problems as they come. Uh, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe not always in the same logical stepwise manner that you would in an academic setting. So you know, this is kind of more like a jazz, there's a little more jazz to this, a little more improvisation. Um, so I think analytical is, is book smarts, practical is more street smarts. Oh, and it literally is called street smarts there. Sorry, I thought I, I thought I was being original there, but apparently the textbook also refers to it as street smarts, sorry. Uh, but here's what this might look like. Analytical intelligence, you know, solving problems, comparing, contrasting, a lot of stuff you're gonna be doing in academic work. Uh, creative intelligence is, is inventing, discovering, theorizing, synthesizing, developing new things. Uh, and then practical intelligence is, you know, kind of working with people. A lot of it has to do with, a lot of that has to do with working with people. Not always the case, but um, that's kind of what it's referring to, kind of working with the general public. Okay, uh, let's see, truth or fiction, tr street, smart, street smarts are a sign of intelligence. We kind of already just talked about this, but go ahead and pause the video and see what you think. The answer is true. Welcome back. It is true. Street smarts are a big part of there. I think they're, you know, uh, you hear this all the time. You see some, oh, they have, this person has book smarts, but they don't have street smarts. Well, or this person has street smarts, but you know, uh, I think most of the time we probably have both. It's just when we are used to maybe one environment or the other, we kind of express one or the other. So, um, Another area, sorry, kind of digressing a little bit. Another area of, of intelligence that doesn't get talked about enough is emotional intelligence. We always talk about intelligence as this thing that goes on between our ears. And yes, that is important to be smart in terms of you know being creative and being able to solve problems. But a big problem that I think a lot of people have um, is understanding and navigating emotional situations, whether it's our own emotions or understanding other people's emotions. But emotional intelligence is this wide, this kind of umbrella of things where it's understanding our own emotions, regulating our own emotions, and also being able to understand and help other people regulate their emotions as well. So it's kind of this two, three-part thing going on. It's, it's knowledge of self and helping ourselves, but also helping other people. And I think this is, um, we don't, we, we teach intelligence, we, we preach intelligence a lot, IQ, but we don't do a lot in terms of teaching EQ, emotional intelligence, or your emotional quotient, because I think if we, you know, those those are important skills to have because you know it helps us cope when when with times when they're not easy, when we're stressed, or even we're depressed, or we, you know, when things just feel like out of, we're out of control. If we can really gain some insight and learn how to control our own emotions, man, that's solving a big problem for a lot of people. Um, you know, stress stress impacts everybody. Not you know, uh, it does. That's the one thing it does not discriminate is against anybody. Okay, uh, creativity, intelligence is also linked to intel uh, linked to intelligence. These two ideas are connected. There's a lot of correlation between people who are creative also having high intelligence. Well, largely it's because of how we define intelligence, its ability to solve problems. And people who are creative typically are better at solving problems. They come up with newer ways to solve problems or different ways to solve problems. And broadly speaking, when we're talking about solving any problem, there are kind of two approaches. There are convergent thinking. And this is kind of thinking within the box. You're thinking about things as they are presented by what the facts are presented. Whereas divergent thinking is thinking outside the box, not limiting yourself in terms of the present facts. And people who are creative tend to use divergent thinking more. And also people who are intelligent tend to use divergent thinking more. So again, there's a lot of overlap between those two, a strong correlation between creativity and intelligence. Okay. Truth of fiction, creative people are intelligent. We just talked about this. It's kind of weird they put them right after the slide, but whatever. Pause the video, let me know what you think. Um, write your answer down, come back when you think you have an answer.
It is true. Creative people are intelligent, and uh, correlation not uh, that that sort of that sort of implies causation there. Um, creative people and intelligent people. There's a ton of overlap, a lot of correlation there. But I imagine we probably could find some intelligent people who maybe aren't creative, you know, in the way we're thinking. And there are probably some creative people who aren't always intelligent. So I mean, it's again, it's not like one to one. All creative people are intelligent. All intelligent people. Creative. I guess if we're talking about problem solving, sure. I guess if that's a strict definition, then sure. But I just want to—I just don't want to imply the causation and correlation mix up there. So how do we measure intelligence? Um, there are some tests. One of the more popular one is called the Stanford Binet Intelligence Scale, um, and it was originally developed from this idea that we can mathematically compute um, intelligence through an IQ score. And this was originally derived from a theory or a, from a, a formula where your IQ was your mental age divided by your chronological age times 100. So your mental age is how you act for your age. So if you're a, you know, if you're a nine-year-old, but you act like a 10-year-old, you know, you would say we would replace, you know, we would put a 10 here and a nine here and multiply that by 10 or by 100, excuse me, and you'd get an intelligence score, I think, of 110. And that would mean you're above average because the standardized average for intelligence is 100. If you, get an, if you get 100 on an IQ score, that means you scored better than 50% of the population who took that test, and you scored um, also worse than 50%, so you're right smack dab in the middle. So anything higher than 100 is above average. Anything below 100 is below average. Okay, so here's a quick comprehension check. You might need to do some math. Uh, a 10-year-old has a mental age of 8. According to the Stanford Binet test, the child's IQ is what? Go ahead and pause the video. Maybe do a quick math comprehension. It's I know you didn't expect to do math today, but this is, I think, pretty simple. Um, so pause the video. Write it down your answer when you come back. Okay, welcome back. So the quotient was uh, mental age divided by chronological age times 100. So this child's mental age is 8. Their chronological age is 10. Uh, so 8 divided by 10 is point, uh, 0.8 times 100 gives us 80, you come up with the IQ of 80, which would be below average. If we reverse that, if we say it's an eight-year-old with an IQ, a mental age of 10, you know, we would get, um, you know, you'd get 10 divided by eight um, times 100, 10 divided by eight times 100, sorry about that. My computer is being wonky, there we go you would get 125. Sorry, my computer kind of froze up. I was trying to get to the next slide. There we go. Okay, 125. Uh, another truth or fiction. Two children can they have it, can answer exactly the same items on an intelligence test correctly, yet one child can obtain an above average in IQ and the other can obtain a below average IQ. What do you think? Pause the video. It is true, again, because mental age, you know, uh, if they are the, if one child is older and they're getting the same amount of questions correct as a child who is younger, um, then they, of course, would be scoring the same mental age, but their chronological age, of course, is going to be different. So they're going to have two different IQ scores. Their quotient is going to be a little different. Here's some example questions of the Stanford Binet test. You can pause the video and take a look at these. You know, uh, for example, some questions might be father is a man, mother is a blank, hamburgers are hot, ice cream is blank. And the idea is to show word fluency to kind of show, um, you know, fill in the blank of the missing words. How quickly can you come up? And a lot of times they're also measured in terms of how fast they come up with the answer too. I'm not sure about the Stanford Binet if that's the case, but other intelligence tests, that is the case. Um, so you have children versus adult items. Children items appear, adult items. There is a Stanford Binet test for children, of course, and one for adults. Um, some other items, the Wexler. Um, the Wexler, I think there's some items on the next slide. Yeah, there's some items on the next slide. That's a really popular one. Um, you know, this is a really good, you have a bunch of different subtests that measure the different areas of IQ, like word fluency and, and memory, especially working memory. Um, you know, and a lot of it is graded in terms of comparison to other people. All of these intelligence tests are comparative. You know, it's, it's everybody who's taken the test, you're comparing to each other and put on percentile scales and also, that'll make a little more sense in a minute. Um, so anyways, here's some example items, you know of the Wexler, oops, sorry about that. Um, you know, you have a block, this is the part of the design, I've actually taken this part of the test myself, um, the block design where you you get a bunch of blocks kind of like this here and you're shown a picture like this and you and you have to quickly, as quick as you can, take these blocks 
and make them look like this picture here. And you're judged not only on how, what the picture, the outcome looks like, of course, but also how fast you do it. It's, you know, it's kind of this idea of working memory, being able to um, solve problems mentally and kind of put things together. So um, IQ scores, as I mentioned earlier, um, are measured, um, you know, 100 is the average. So if you scored 100, you would land right here. This is known as a normal distribution or a normal curve. And this is how um, intelligence scores are plotted based on standard deviations, which you don't need to know about. But um, each one of these little blocks here is a standard deviation. And as we go one standard deviation away from the media or away from the, the center, um, you know, this way we're going up in intelligence scores. If we go this way, we're going down. And notice how the, the graph gets smaller and smaller. As we get closer to like 130 and above, I mean, we're talking about a very small portion of people who score that high on an intelligence test. That's considered genius and above or superior, however you want to link, uh, however you want to describe it. And the same thing with the opposite side. You know, there's just not a lot of people who are going to score below 70. Um, and that's considered, I believe, intellectually disabled. So, um, you know, most people tend to score here. Most people score here in this purple area, either one standard deviation to the left or one to the right. So the vast majority, and the numbers reflect about 85% will score here, and the rest are in the tails. Um, intelligence tests are measured, or intelligence, like most tests, are measured in terms of reliability and validity. Reliability just means, is this measuring what we mean, or excuse me, are, are the scores going to be similar for test retest, for example? Like if I give you an IQ test score, IQ test today, and you get 100 and like 10 on it, and I give it to you a week from now, like we would expect you to get, or you know, maybe a month from now or, or six months from now, we would expect you to get similar, a similar score if they are reliable and if it's a reliable instrument. But if you went from like 110 to a 75, you know, unless something's going on in your life that we don't know about, you know, we might start to question the reliability of that instrument, especially if that's happening with a lot of people, if not just one person, but a lot of people. And then validity is, hey, does this measure what we actually intend to measure? Are we actually measuring intelligence or are we measuring something else? And so, you know, you want to see how much your test correlates maybe with current existing instruments like that measure intelligence. So, you know, if somebody were to come up with a new intelligence test that's like the Stanford Binet, well, you want to make sure that your scores correlate with the scores of the Stanford Binet then. If they don't, then you might have some problems with validity. Now, there's also a concern that intelligence tests um, in the past have have been culturally biased, so um, especially against especially against students who come from lower socioeconomic backgrounds or uh, racial ethnic minorities. So now we see tests that are considered cultural free, culturally free biased tests, um, where you don't have you know I think there's some exa yeah exact here's an example. Um, what comes next in this series and you have to choose from all of these you know in the past there have been intelligence test questions that ask children things like describe playing croquet you know for example as an intelligence test and you know if you're a if you are a you know middle class or upper upper you know class or upper socioeconomic status student with you know who comes from from the dominant cultural background yeah you probably can do that but if you're, you know, maybe a student, Hispanic student who from lower socioeconomic status, you know, maybe your parents are new to the country and you bear, you know, you speak some English, but not a lot of English. Maybe you've never even heard that word croquet before. So how the, how the heck could you know how to describe that? So a lot of the tests are now trying to move towards being biased and cultural, uh, culturally free or culturally fair, I should say. Um, we've talked about this in the past, but, you know, we, we can see, we've seen an explosion. A lot of it has to do with our understanding of intelligence, our understanding of a lot of the biases we once had about intelligence are being removed. You know, it was once believed that men are just vastly more intelligent and superior to, to women, but we just see that as the times have changed, especially an explosion, you know, that is just not the case anymore. We are seeing far more professions that are that require advanced degrees are being occupied by women uh, at a higher, much bigger rate than ever before. Uh, because a lot of that ties back to what we know about intelligence. That 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 doesn't that's not true that men are more and in, more intelligent by far, you know, that are superior or anything compared to women. You know, it's just a lot of it comes from the our understanding about these ideas. So truth or fiction, intelligence tests measure many things other than intelligence. Pause the video, what do you think? 
True. In some cases, yeah. I mean, there. You know, again, it's getting back to this ability. You know, um, it's getting into um, you know things like culture. And again, I meant you know I showed you some of those tests that are culturally fair, but those those are not all the ones that are. Uh, the standard practice, they're not always, all the intelligence tests don't embrace this idea of being culturally fair. So in some cases, intelligence tests are measuring things that are not related directly to intelligence, but more have to do with your experience, your background. Um, a lot of what we know about intelligence comes from studying, studying kinship, studying people who are related, especially twins, especially um, uh, identical twins. Um, you know, there is correlation existing between intelligence and, and, and genetics, but obviously there are other factors involved. Um, other factors involved, you know, I'm trying to move through this a little bit quickly, sorry. Yeah, we can explain about 40 to 60% of, of intelligence through heredity, basically through genetics. Um, but that leaves a large portion of, of intelligence can be explained by other factors, including environments, you know, including the friends you hang out with, the food you eat, you know, all the things other than just the genetics that go into it. So there's a lot of factors at play. It's not just simply you're born with intelligence. Obviously, some people are given kind of a leg up because maybe you have two really smart parents, two really intelligent parents that gives somebody a leg up. But that doesn't mean the rest of us, if you, you weren't born with genius parents, doesn't mean you can't be a genius or be really smart yourself. Yourself. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into intelligence, like hard work, like putting yourself in the right position, making good choices, surrounding yourself with good people, taking care of your body. So, it, you know, you can maximize your brain's ability to think by, by feeding it good stuff. Whoa, why did the figure go? There it is. Sorry, the figure disappeared. I hope you all saw that too, because for some reason the figure was not there. Um, but this is showing the connection between intelligence um, uh, and, and IQ you know, we see a pretty large portion of it. When we talk about identical twins who are reared together, we can explain a lot of their intelligence based on heredity. Um, identical twins who are reared apart, the number starts to get smaller. But as you can see, I mean, it just kind of gets smaller and smaller for the most part. Uh, environmental factors play a huge part in it. You know, your the, the, the home environment you have, do your parents read to you? Do your parents have stimulating materials in the house? How much how much good food do you have in the house? Are you sitting in front of a TV all day or are you doing stimulating things like going to a museum or going to the park or playing outside? You know, what kind of schools are you going to? You know, those are things that have a profound impact on our intelligence. Um, so genetics are important, but they are not everything by any means. Um, an interesting trend in intelligence is that intelligence scores for the most part just kept rising and rising and rising from the years 1947 to about 2002. We kind of see some leveling off at that point. And a lot of it we think has to do with social and cultural factors, like people have more access to information. Obviously, you know, in the 90s and into the 2000s with the internet explosion, we see advent of better dieting for the most part, although we can make a case that's not always the always true just the quality of life is risen overall for people during that time at least in the western world um, we're talking about you know north america uh, europe uh, more probably more affluent areas of course um so again there's a lot of factors that are involved in that i mean there's some genetic factors in terms of intelligence genetic factors what you inherit from your parents uh your environment and also uh, socioeconomic factors like you know access to good schools uh, your motivation, I mean, all kinds of things fa factor in in terms of intelligence or whether you express intelligence. So that is really it for chap chapter number seven. Um, we threw it, there was a, we covered a lot of ground in chapter seven. We looked at sleeping, we, or I'm sorry, we looked at, uh, I'm thinking about chapter four, I apologize. We looked at language, we looked at thinking, uh, and we looked at, at uh, intelligence. So we kind of stuffed three really broad chapter, three broad topics into one chapter. So um, that's really it for chapter seven. I don't want to overwhelm you with too much more. Um, thanks for tuning in and we'll pick back up with chapter eight. See you then.